Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Griplock Preview for the Jonesboro Open. We are back with yet more Disc Golf Pro Tour action. Super excited um, to be heading back to the disc side of heaven in Jonesboro, wow. Arkansas. Uh, a little bit of a redesign going on at this course, but not really because it's probably 80% the exact same holes, just in a different a reordering of the order. Course, which changes a lot. Um, and then there is a few new holes, but I don't really think it's going to play that much different. No. Um, if you're watching us right now, we are on a slightly different set because we're in the process of moving still, and we haven't fully set the set up. But if you're listening, it should sound the same. Um, so, like I had mentioned, slightly different, but historically this place is one of the easiest courses on tour, even though it is the longest or one of the longest. It's not the longest, but it's one of the longest. And James Conrad set the course record here with a 17 under last year. Like I said, redesign did happen, but a lot of the holes are pretty similar yeah it's not a ton different but the restructuring of things uh does make it interesting uh, what i will say is what as soon as i heard about the, the, the holes being reordered i wanted to look immediately because this is a course that only has a few really signature holes there's a lot of par threes and fours that are quite simple pretty straightforward look similar um so i you know i wanted to see where they put those really recognizable holes and what i found was um the holes i was really referring to was the old hole six and the old hole 16. So six is that shot. You're going to see a billion different pro players posting reels from because it's the, the like chip over the water to like the fenced in Island, kind of like hole eight at Maple Hill. And they moved that, um, I, that one to 15 and then 14 now is the old 16 which was the reachable par 5 and 2 that you could clear the water with the big second shot so what's interesting is they took those two most recognizable holes in my opinion I think a lot of people would agree and they made them the 14 and 15 stretch on the course which is towards the end of the tournament but it, I would have I would have been I'm a little shocked they reordered everything and didn't try to push those just at least a, like another hole further back. Um, now, I will say hole 18, they're using like the nearly 500 foot par three for the men at least um, as that hole, which I think is interesting because it's a very demanding hole. But it's also interesting in the sense that there's like a very common layup play there because of how far it is and how tough the OB is right before the basket. So I think there are certain scenarios where people... Depending on how this tournament plays out with the winner, people could say, wow, that whole 18 rocked because like a certain player was forced to try and carry that OB. Or they could be like, that was the dumbest thing ever because they just they get a free layup off the tee if they can take it. Yeah, I know. It definitely is an interesting choice. I think a lot of the from what I was gathering from different practice rounds, it seemed like a lot of the restructuring and reflow was mainly to enhance the uh, viewer experience on the grounds. Yeah. Um, by in increasing the like area for the tournament central, the area for vending and stuff like that. So makes sense. It's kind the part of the, that we can never, you know, not being there, you can never really factor that in as just yeah. seeing it from the videos. It makes sense. And also I, I like that they tried to put those holes late in the round. I'm just assuming that the reason it's not 17, 18 or 16, 17 is simply just the flow. Yeah. Like sure probably just a piece of yeah. the property where stuff goes is probably how it ended up working out. But one thing with Jonesboro is always the weather this weekend. It looks pretty solid. Um, there's a chance of rain like leading up to the tournament and then a chance of rain after the tournament but as of right now there's no chances of rain during the tournament which is exciting um and the wind doesn't look to be that crazy so well the first we'll see if that ends up being i'll say the first thing you notice when you watch this course is there's plenty of room for error off the tee a lot of these drives i mean they're tight enough but not enough for these pros to be hitting trees early really um the guys who are playing well are going to be having no issue hitting fairways uh especially in no wind and that is where the putting comes into play you know, as James Conrad, you know, shooting that 17 under, you don't shoot 17, 16 under without putting really well. Yeah. So if the wind dies down, uh, if the wind's up, you know, disc golf just becomes way harder. The course will look a lot different. But if the wind does stay down, this course is going to play pretty straightforward. Um, it's very manageable. It's not super easy to get yourself in trouble. And that means that the guys who are putting the best, making the putts 50 to 30 to 50 foot footers and gaining those, you know, four or five extra strokes around on the guys who aren't making them, those are the ones that are going to push themselves up the leaderboard. Yeah. Now, speaking of some players who have consistently pushed themselves up the leaderboard here, Ricky and Calvin dominate the this event yeah they've actually won six of the last seven the only one they missed was paul Macbeth's win and i believe it was 2019 yeah um and calvin actually has a chance to win his third straight which would put him with ricky as the only player to three peat at an event since 2019 ledgestone mm -hmm. um so ricky and calvin kind of the two 
favorites based on statistics coming into this event, but that is not factoring in what we've seen coming into this year. What do we think of Ricky and Calvin with this this uh, event? Well, Calvin's in such an interesting spot. He keeps getting thrown into these narratives. You know, already the narrative that's kind of creating itself this year is like, okay, we're we're getting further in the season. Calvin's been around. He hasn't gotten the win yet this year, though. Um, and he, I know people get frustrated when he gets thrown in there because they're like, well, he's always so close to the top of the leaderboard. And that's true. But, you know, there's two other young players right now that have come out dominating the season. And he's not, you know, he's not gotten himself in, in the winner's circle yet. So you have to talk about it. You know, if he's going to be on the same tier as those guys, well, they've won multiple times. Yeah. You know, there there's a way to win out there. And I think this one. You know, it's kind of like it was, it was, this is a similar story to Ricky last event, you know, at Texas States was like, okay, Ricky kind of owns this event. He hasn't gotten a win yet this year. What are we going to see from Rick? Kind of shifts to Calvin um, at this event is like, okay, he owns this event. He's super good at this course. Is this going to be where he gets himself over the hump plenty early in the season? And last year, I believe this, now this event came later in the season last year, like 20 days later, I think. But last year, this was the last time. That's why I just verified. This was his, yeah. his we we're right at a year since his last right. win, which so, was Jonesboro. Exactly. So uh, that is, there's a lot of things swirling in the air for Calvin. Um, obviously, I think he has a great chance, but it's certainly, I, you got to feel it at some point. And then for Rick, you know, expected great things from him at Texas States, just did not really show up. I am, I, I know Rick is still very capable. Obviously, we've seen that time and time again, but I think he may just be getting to a point in his career. You know, you, some of these guys get paid like Rick and, you know, it's tough to see. It's tough to sometimes I don't know if I see that killer instinct out of Rick all the time. You, you get flashes of it, but I don't know if every tournament I, he shows up just looking as hungry as he used to. And I don't know. Like I want to see I want to see a Rick who's pushing for, for wins more often because I don't want it's way too early in his career to be thinking about him doing a little plateau or maybe even a little decline. He's still so young. I mean, he's what, 30? I don't even know if he's maybe 30 yet. like, yeah, that's what I'm saying. So, um, I hope that he can kind of kind of pick his game up too and, and notch a few wins this year because it's just it's just intimidating trying to beat the, the guys that are playing the best right now. Yeah, no, I, I I still like Calvin and Rick at this event. Both of them, like we've mentioned, have a lot of history, and I think Ricky especially that history is important. Um, but as you did mention, it doesn't it doesn't always ro- work out because Texas States would have been. You know that all signs pointed to yeah. that was a different course this year, but it's I think true. a lot yeah. of the historically Ricky's done good, and it's been a lot of different courses at Texas. That State. is the difference. Like we're at, even though the cha- courses changed it's the order, the same. it's Jonesboro, yeah. so Calvin sh- it should be right in his wheelhouse. Um, so Ricky, though, I'm, I don't think eyes are nearly as much on Ricky as they are on Calvin, because at yeah. this point in last year's season, Calvin had already notched, I believe, three wins. I think this is his third and final win of that season. Yeah. yeah. So at this point, Calvin came out the gates hot and this season really lined up for Calvin too. I know he's been dealing on and off with a little bit of an injury, um, but post this event last year, he went cold. Now cold for him last year was basically all top fives, Mm -hmm. but he's already broke his top five streak. He's already like a lot of the streaks he's breaking are not, good streaks yeah he just needs a break if that makes sense he's just got to put it all together for a weekend you know like i said there's just been it's been a start of the season where to beat gannon and ab has just been nearly impossible at these events um you know i mean gannon out there is practically the grim reaper he he looks like he's gonna win everything and um so that's that's the thing you have to deal with is you have to really put it all together because Calvin has been good enough on a lot of these weeks to where if those guys weren't competing, he would have had a really serious chance to win. Um, but he's just kind of getting shut down. So I think he we, he just needs to have a week where he comes out really, really hot, can put together some top rounds and uh, gain a little confidence back. And um, if he can get himself in the mix, I still have all the confidence in the world that Calvin Heiberg can win down the stretch. You know, he's won this. I think he won this event in a playoff a couple years ago. Yeah, against uh, Paul. Against Paul. T-Pad Gate. Uh, right, T-Pad Gate. But, uh, you know, he's shown that he can do that at this very tournament so yeah it's, it, you never know where a player's head's at right like rick going into texas states we always said like he seems like a guy who gets confidence off of this idea that this would be a great way to get the win total starter for the year he owns his event you don't know like is calvin walking into jonesboro thinking i love it here it's a great weekend to win or is he thinking man everybody's gonna be looking at me as the guy who wins this event there's pressure for me to to get my win total going so it's it's just tough to know it is tough to know now you've been talking a lot about gannon and ab but historically they have both struggled here so out of players who have played jonesboro at least three times gannon ranks 17th ab ranks 31st mm-hmm. um now again we're talking historically their yeah. performance at this event 
Are we seeing a different Gannon and AB this year to where none of those stats matter? They're just still going to dominate? AB, yes. AB, I'm taking everything he's done statistically from last year and previous and throwing it out the window because he's a different player this year. He's got all the same talent, but he's got a different attack on the course. He's got a different grasp on his putt. Um, And so therefore for him, I'm willing to, because he's such a different player and he's won twice now, I'm willing to throw that all, all that stuff out. Um, you know, it's if he's done well at a course just because of the way it sets up, that's one thing. But when you got a guy who's playing the way he is right now, he's good anywhere. You know, he's versatile enough that he can play anywhere. So I'm throwing that out. Gannon, he's been a very consistent player over the last few years. So it's a little bit easier to look at and kind of gauge. He had a pretty, he had a decent tournament here last year. I think he was top 20, um, may have been even higher than that. But, um, yeah, I, I think his game sets up great at this course. Like I said, I, I think a lot of this event is going to come down to if there is wind i like him even more that's where guys like that's where him and calvin can really shine if there's wind um love to throw over stable plastic uh and trust it good wind putters especially gannon i mean he just launches his putter so yeah it's just gonna it's just gonna depend on when if his putter's hot or not but i think he's another guy where he hasn't been bad enough at this tournament to convince me otherwise yeah no both of them I think both of them have a very solid shot here because realistically, when I think of Jonesboro, I think of a thrower's course. I think of like, you know, hit your fairway, has a decent bit of distance, and all of that points to A.B. and Gannon. So historically, them not performing well here, you know, it is what it is. I don't think that that's a stat to get too, too caught up on because we are seeing just dominance out of both of them. Um, And I'm very interested to see like which one's going to budge first and break this top four streak they're both on. Yeah. Because they're just they're ludicrous right now. Um, So one of them has to break at some point. Is it this weekend? Personally, I don't think so. I think I think think both of them are. I would be possibly up there. Yeah, I would be astonished. I would be astonished if if either of them fall outside of the top ten. Yeah, no, top ten I think is a lock. Yeah, top four it's hard to lock it because like that's just so hard to keep up. And it depends on the win because you mentioned like the thing about you know. I think every course so far this year has catered to the guys who who can throw far. Um, that goes out the window a little bit once the wind comes into play, uh, because then you got to really play the wind. And I do think this course, though, there are some there are you know when you have when you have like a lot of holes that are par fours around six fifty to seven hundred feet. Yes, the guys that are mashing it out there are going to get five hundred feet down the fairway. But the difference between throwing for these pros, the difference between a 350 foot upshot and a 250 foot upshot in open courses like this, where they're throwing a lot of hyzers, it's not that big. They're going to get inside the circle almost every time. So that's where I do think there are plenty of guys, you know, it would not shock me if this was Isaac Robinson's first blip on the radar this year, if he could get in the mix, because you just have to have sufficient distance out here and then get yourself in range of the basket and make putts. Now, not Isaac Robinson, but uh, easy to confuse him. Chris Dickerson historically plays this event very well yeah, and is actually like off to a kind of sneaky start to the season. Not bad. Back-to-back top tens yeah. coming into this week. What do you think of his chances? Yeah, he he's coming in under the radar right now, which I think is good for him. And he has been quietly putting together pretty good golf. I think towards the end of last season, he started to figure it out a little bit. He just had a rough patch when he entered with uh, Discraft at first. But he's still a good golfer. And like I said, the same way this, play, this course can cater to um, a guy like Isaac Robinson, it's certainly Ken and Chris Dickerson, uh, guys who can place the disc well off the tee and can get their putters going. Another guy who can be a little streaky, though. That's that's the thing is um, the thing that hurts Dickerson and Isaac Robinson the most is both their putters are world class. When they're at their best, they look like nobody could putt better than them, but they can be a little bit streaky at times. Um, they both have kind of a similar, kind of a similar putting release. Honestly, they both like to spin from the chest a little bit. Isaac, I think it's same. Yeah, that's what I'm. Dialed that's with you now. <laughs> Isaac, I think it's a little tighter rotation, and I think he comes from the right side of the basket more. Whereas I think Dickerson likes to kind of attack it head on and gets a little more wobble on it. But um, yeah, I, I did another guy. That's another guy. I think this stretch for with uh, Jonesboro and Music City. I think that. That's a sweet spot on the tour. And we say that it's every year, but for Chris Dickerson, that is a sweet spot on the tour to win. And then it usually that's followed up by uh, a WR Jackson Champions Cup this year, a little bit different of a Champions Cup. Yeah. But um, yeah, this is a patch in the tour where there's a couple specific players that you really have to like. Here's what I'm going to say. I think Chris Dickerson gets a win either here or at Music City. I think one of those <laughs> I think two we said this exact thing last year. <laughs> no, we, we loved him at Music City and then he let us down, but not this year. Not this Chris Dickerson. He's, okay. he's picking things up. He's heating up at the right time. The problem is... I think he wins one of these next two weekends. The problem is a guy who almost won Music City last year as well was Anthony Barella. And yeah. this year... He 
he is a guy who will win in music. Bet season. me some points. But you, what's the bet? I don't know. Like, do you, are you, would you like to bet that, point that Dickerson hungry. wins either? Either, yeah. One of the next two. And I bet that he I'll doesn't put, win either. I'll put. I'll sacrifice one point on the line. What is it? What are you giving me if he does win? What for the for the rate of one point? Yeah. Uh, I would give you four. Okay, so if he wins one of the next two, I get four. If he doesn't, and I if get he doesn't, one. I'll out give of you one. your total, out of my total. So technically, I gain two points on you. Yeah, but you don't have to give me four out of your total. <sighs> okay, maybe we should just should we just well, that's not fair to Joe though. So they have to come from the totals. Okay, so yeah, you give me four from your total. Yeah, and I'll give you one from mine. Yeah, fair enough. I like it. Yeah. All right. I'll take it. Love it. Speaking of Joe, let's throw it over to her and get the FPO storylines. Hello and welcome into the FPO preview show for the Play It Again Sports Jonesboro Open presented by Westside Discs. At this event, we have 52 women who are looking to take down this next elite series on the Disc Golf Pro Tour at the Disc Side of Heaven. Let's run it back to the last round of the 2023 Jonesboro Open when we had a very tight battle at the top. In the final round, we had Missy Gannon, Aria Castrita, Haley King, and Kat Merch hoping to take home the win. On the last hole, Haley King and Kat Merch were actually all tied up. They went into the last hole and they both took a par and then ended up forcing a playoff. And in this playoff, we had Haley King going first. Her drive was a little bit slightly turned over and went into the woods. And then we had Kat Merch who just laid it up to the opening and then just did a solid, very routine approach to get to the basket. Next, we had Haley King, who went with her approach, and it actually ended up going really, really short. So she had a very long putt for a comebacker, and she ended up missing that putt, and Kat Merch took home the victory. There's a little story up on Jomez, just how much disc golf has impacted her life, and it's a good way to have a little bit more perspective as to what disc golf can do for you or just to share her story a little bit more and how much this win meant to her. Going into this tournament, Kat Merch is now the player to beat at the Jonesboro Open. Let's go into some of the players that could challenge her victory from last year. Some names that I think that could do really well at this event are Holland Hanley for sure. She had a decent showing last year and now she's only built on that confidence and she's made some more mental corrections as well, like where she's making better choices that suit her game a little better. I think that she has a really good shot at this event. Ella Hansen is another player that I think could do really well here. She has both elite distance forehand and backhand. She can curve the disc from left to right and right to left as well. And I think you need those shots here at Jonesboro. I just think that this course really suits her. And if she can get her mental game figured out by this tournament, I think she has a really good shot. Two players that are no stranger to the fairway and parked percentage game are Evelina and Hannah. And I know we've been saying it. We are broken record. We keep saying the same thing. But if they could manage their putting green and get the disc in the basket, I think that both of them could do so, so well here. They are excellent with their angles and good at keeping the disc on the fairway, so I really think that they have a good shot. I was really impressed with how Haiti Lenya's game has been in the early parts of 2024. In the events that we've seen her at, she is showing that she has distance and accuracy, And I think that she has the capability to get the disc close to the basket. And she's also a really good putter. She's been showing that she can handle those pressure situations. I'm excited to see what she does here. Missy Gannon is consistent both mentally and physically. She doesn't really have that flashy of a game. She throws thrashers basically on any angle, gets the disc to the basket, and gives herself a look usually cashes in on those putts, and that is why they call her Big Money Missy. Valerie Monahano was not at this event last year because of her ankle injury, and she is mentally one of the toughest players, I think, on the Disc Golf Pro Tour. She doesn't get easily frustrated, and I feel like she has what it takes to take this one down. And lastly, of course, we have our current world champion, Kristen Tatar. She is so refined in her game. She doesn't do anything crazy. She's very good at staying in her own lane and playing her game and letting others 
kind of mess up and take the bogeys. I would love to see Kristen take this one down as well. Someone who actually didn't play this event last year and who I think could have a really good showing is actually Own Scoggins. This course has somewhat similar vibes to Deeglo in some ways, and she actually won that event last year. I think that she could be a pretty sneaky little pick for a podium finish or maybe even to take this one down. Let me know what you guys think. Back over to you guys. So two players that Joe brought up that I thought were interesting is Ella Hansen and Holland Handley. She brought both of them up as possible contenders here. What do you think of their chances? Um... Two players that I've been looking for more out of this year, but I think like the FPO field, there's some players that just, they pop onto the scene, uh, they kind of emerge and you see them here and there, but they never really become that consistent player you were looking for. The same thing kind of happened with Haley King. Um, and she's dealt with injuries a lot recently. I think she was trying to kind of starting to kind of emerge last year, but we, we, I think what happens is we get these players into the FPO field and we're so like starving for some new talent to bring into that, uh, field to like really challenge Kristen and, and make the top end of that leaderboard better. And so when a player jumps in, we're immediately just waiting and waiting. It's like, we're just staring at them like, okay, now be a guy, be the player that is top 10 every week. Just do that. And I think that that results in a lot of these players where we don't really know how to rank them because they do just kind of pop in here and there. And I think Holland Hanley and Ella Hansen are both that right now. I think there have been times during like stretches, they've been able to really figure it out. Um, but then a lot of stretches where they're not, and they both played well at this event last year. Another player, obviously that did play well at this event was Haley King last year. Um, obviously had that, I think it was a playoff with cat merch. No lost in the last hole. Or it was just the last hole, but um, yeah, exciting end to that town around. And she was making putts from everywhere. So this is going to be very interesting to look at from FPO just because of how many people, I mean, Kristen was pretty far down the leaderboard. Own wasn't there last year. Um, so yeah, very tough to predict just based on last year. Like I said, though, Ella and Holland, I'm just not ready there hasn't been enough proof for me to go into a tournament and be like, yep, this is going to be their tournament because I just don't know what to key off of to make the prediction. Yeah, I, I, I like... That's I just feel like I've seen, <laughs> I've seen more out of Holland than I have out of Ella. Um, yes, I agree with that. I, I think Ella seems to... Ella hasn't learned how to win yet. Yeah, She, she is more likely to get into a pressure situation and fall apart from what we've seen than Holland. Um, I like them both game their games line up with this course, but yeah. if, if I'm picking one over the other, I'm taking Holland, but I'm not taking either in my top three yeah. this week personally. It's just now, you can't do it yet. With it being a thrower course, it also does bring in Evelina Solonen. Yeah. Uh, do you think that the throw, throwing alone will be enough to carry her? I just don't. I like, like I said, I want to believe that this course is going to benefit the throwers a lot. But there's just a part of me, like I see the way the course plays out and I see everybody getting greens in regulation. I, I look at the field and I do not think that that um, that strokes gained T to green is, green is going to be a huge stat here because I, I see a lot of holes where everybody's getting inside a C2 in reg. Like there's just not a ton of trouble if the wind doesn't pick up, that is. Um, and so I just think that putting is going to be so big that no, I don't think Evelina can win the, this tournament that way. I um I disagree. I like Evelina here. I, I agree with what you're saying, but I think you're missing. I think a thrower is going to have a lot of closer putts for birdie than like the the putting differential isn't drastic. Well, how enough. close does Evelina have to be? Chess.com <laughs> inside like 25 feet. Every other event, we yeah, won't talk about. We're not it. at the chess.com. Maybe this is it though. Um, but I like it. I like Evelina here a I lot. I thought about um, it. I thought about it. I, I think that because I, I just think she's going to be able to give herself so many looks, and she's not going to have to convert on that many to be in contention, mm -hmm. um, which is where you want to be if you're Evelina. Uh, now we do also have to finally talk about the three-headed monster. I'm calling him of own Kristen Missy. Yeah. What do we think? Out of those three, let's just do it this way. Out of own Kristen Missy, who finishes the best? I've got to say, Kristen, I, 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 I'm really banking off of this A tier win that Kristen took over own last week. I know there's not a ton of stock to place in those, but I do think that helps her out because I think she probably needed that, um, especially beating own at that event. I think that own will be dangerous at this event. I think Kristen needs to bring her game. Like I, I, I do think she'll be dangerous. Um, and Missy, you know, really you pick Missy because she stays around. So if Kristen and Owen aren't playing well, Missy is going to be that third person that wins. I don't think she's going to go out and just take it from them necessarily. But um, yeah, that's that's kind of where my head's at. I mean, I, it's still the three that you think are going to win most yeah. weeks. Um, 
I think I got to go with Kristen too. Uh, I will spoiler alert. We're about to get into our predictions. I don't think I have Owen in my top three, and I didn't pick Kristen to win. But I think Kristen is going to perform You're the wild, best out of these man. three. Yeah, I went crazy this week. Hey, sometimes you got to make. But hey, up. here's the deal with with point standing for prediction. I took the lead after yeah. last week. I'm now at 23. Trevor's at 22. Joe's at 21. So it's really tight, right? Very now. tight race. We'll start off with my MPO predictions. I want Gannon Burr in third place. Okay. Um, I do want the robot chicken in second. Wow. And okay. uh, I have Calvin Heimberg completing his three. That means you have to take Chris Dickerson to win at Music City. I don't have to take him to win. He just has to has to win. But I don't have to pick him. I mean, put your money where your mouth is a little bit. I did. I, did. I bet a point. So, if he, But if he doesn't win this week, you said he's going to win one of the two. So I think that means you need to put him first. Or I could just hedge week. because if he wins, I get four. <laughs> okay. If he wins, I get four. Just, and if I pick someone else to win, I get three. So just so they know, you're not actually predicting the winner. You're just trying to hedge your bets. Which, to be fair, that's how I play FPO every single week. Yeah. You just got to – this is all about points here. This is all yeah. about points. I want Calvin, Chris, Gannon. Okay. I am taking Gannon to win, Calvin in second, AB in third. Can't take AB out of the top three right now. I just can't do it. I did. Um, might bold. be dumb. Joe, You're on the bold. other end, and went Gannon to win, Calvin second, AB third. So same. she followed you. Yeah. Dead on. Same picks. Um, for FPO, I think I'm we taking, have the, I'm, I think we have the same picks completely. <laughs> for FPO, I'm taking <laughs> Evelina Solomon to take it down, Chris Natar wow. to come in second, and Missy Gannon to round out my top three. Okay. I am taking Kristen to win, Owen in second, Missy in third. She looks like Joe and, and I. And uh, that's what Joe went. So Kristen we owned Missy. Picks. So y'all All aren't right, getting any points on each other. That's crazy. Um, now, my dark horse pick is going to be none other than Sir Andrew Presnell. I like him here. Like the Prez? Yeah, I like him. I'm taking Yakub Semerad because he has been absolutely filthy whenever he plays this year. He's been like top 20 every single event. Um, he's been very sneaky good this year. Uh, and Joe is going with old trusty. Joseph Anderson slipped out of the top 30 again and yeah. he could win this event. He Joseph Anderson. That's the thing about him that makes him scary is I legitimately think he could go ahead and win. He just might. We'll find out and you can find out alongside us by tuning in this weekend to the Jonesboro open. Get out there, watch some disc golf and we'll be back on I like, Monday. I kind of like Cole Dolan at this. Point. I like Cole Dolan too. I love Cole Dolan. I'm his number one fan and we'll be back on Monday to wrap up everything that goes down.